Welcome to this brief introduction to the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 12 through 30. The content can be downloaded in a document at the link given below. Let's get into it. Our structure or outline of the book of Acts suggests that there may be seven great parts or movements describing the spread of the gospel after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The second of these movements concerns the apostles' witness in Jerusalem and Judea. Part A, the church in Jerusalem is planted, requiring, first of all, that the Lord choose a twelfth apostle. Reading verses 12 and 13, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mountain called the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered Jerusalem, they went to the upstairs room where they were staying. A Sabbath day's journey refers to the distance the rabbis permitted a person to travel on the Sabbath without breaking the Sabbath, specified in Tractate Sotha 5.3 of the Mishnah as 2,000 cubits, a cubit being about 18 inches. In this case, the distance was about half a mile, or a kilometer. What is the theological importance of the Mount of Olives regarding messianic or end times expectations? Very briefly, Ezekiel chapter 11 reports that in the distant past, the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain that is on the east side of the city, that is, the Mount of Olives. Only a few days earlier, Jesus had been crucified at Golgotha, which scholars say was located atop the Mount of Olives. And then in reference to the far future, according to the prophet Zechariah, on that day, his feet, that is, Messiah's feet, shall stand on the Mount of Olives. The principle that we follow in these studies is that solid Bible interpretation requires that we get into the mind, as much as we are able, of ancient Jews, for at least three reasons. First, because God revealed the Bible to them in terms of their languages and worldview. Secondly, the Bible means what it meant to them due to the fact that, number three, Jesus spoke to them, not to evolutionists nor to creationists, not to Calvinists nor to Arminians, not to Catholics, to Orthodox, nor to Protestants, neither to Baptists nor to Pentecostals. Verses 13 and 14. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas son of James were there. All these continued together in prayer, some documents add and request, with one mind together with the women or with their wives, and some documents add and children, along with Mary, or Maria, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. If you lead a discussion group on this passage, you might pose this query. What had Jesus given to his twelve apostles, or promised to give them, that has relevance to this passage? Well, we would like to suggest that, according to Luke chapter 9, Jesus gave to the twelve apostles his authority and power to heal the sick, to cast out demons, and to declare the good news. Jesus further promised that God the Father would grant to them whatever they agreed on and asked for in Jesus' name. And thirdly, that the Father would send his Holy Spirit to abide with them, reminding them of all that Jesus had said. A second query to discuss what was so important about the number 12? Were not 11 apostles enough? 
it does not take much imagination to suppose that because Jacob had 12 sons, that number became to signify the totality of the tribes of Israel, both the northern and the southern tribes. Secondly, whilst the northern ten tribes remained in captivity, the messianic kingdom could not come. <clears throat> All twelve tribes would have to become part of that kingdom. And thirdly, the apostles would one day sit on twelve thrones, judging the tribes of Israel, according to the promise that Jesus gave in Luke 22. Part of the theological importance of this text relates to this question. How can Christian churches be sure that they operate by the authority of Jesus Christ? Well, we understand that the apostles' teaching would become the standard of truth for the early churches. For that reason, churches would admit into their canon of authoritative scriptures only those books written by an apostle or approved by an apostle. Protestant churches hold apostolic authority to be greater than that of church hierarchies or officials. Continuing on in verses 15 through 17, In those days Peter stood up amongst the believers, a gathering of about 120, saying, Brothers, the scripture had to be, or as some manuscripts say, must be fulfilled that the Holy Spirit foretold through David concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. For Judas was counted as one of us and received a share in this ministry. Text in gray type indicate variant readings from some manuscripts. Logical thinkers may be asking, how could Peter know that David, 1,000 years earlier, had written about Judas by name in particular? Let me make some suggestions. First, Peter believed that David's words were predictions about Jesus and therefore also about his betrayer, whom we know to be Judas. Others suggest that Peter found these psalms to be a good fit, so he was applying them to Judas. Some also suggest that Peter was inspired by the same Holy Spirit to repurpose Scripture, that is, use it in a way that the Old Testament had not a fourth suggestion comes from John 13, 18, in which Jesus cites Psalm 41, 9 about Judas, and in John 17, 12 says that Judas fulfills Scripture as the son of perdition, because Jesus believed the Psalms were talking about Judas, so do the apostles. We're going to skip verses 18 and 19, a parenthesis perhaps inserted by Luke after his sojourn in Judea. Verses 20 through 22. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his house become deserted, and let there be no one to live in it, and let another take his position of responsibility. Thus one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time the Lord Jesus associated with us beginning from his baptism by John until the day he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness of his resurrection together with us. Theologians have wondered uh, through the centuries, was Peter too hasty? Would not Paul, the Apostle Paul, later become that twelfth apostle? Well, problem is, Paul did not meet the qualifications to be a witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ for two reasons. First, he did not accompany Jesus during his earthly ministry, as had the twelve. Nor was he amongst those to whom Jesus appeared alive before his ascension into the heavens. In the quotation from Psalm 69, the Hebrew Bible has plural pronouns, whereas Peter was quoting from the Greek Septuagint, or 
Greek version of the Old Testament, which has singular pronouns. So pronoun wars are of early origin. In the quotation from Psalm 106, the writer was quoting what enemies were saying about him, not what he was saying about them. So this then raises another query. Was Peter and therefore Luke mistaken in their interpretation of these Psalms? If so, then how can the New Testament be inspired by God and contain such mistaken interpretations? Well, again, we have some suggestions. First, literal prediction and fulfillment are not the only way in which the New Testament makes use of the Tanakh, the Old Testament. It is quite clear that New Testament writers often draw analogies or similarities between the Tanakh and their own teaching, which their readers would find compelling. And thirdly, drawing such analogies was a common Jewish method approved in writings of some rabbis. And of course, the New Testament is a Jewish document. So we read in verse 23, they proposed two candidates, Joseph called Barsabbas and also called Justus and Matthias. One ancient document makes out Peter to be the one who proposed the two candidates. So let us pose this query. Who are they who proposed the two men? Three common interpretations of who they were include the apostles, for it was they who best knew which men were qualified. Some Protestants like to suggest that they were the assembly, for the crowd knew whom they wanted. This could be an impersonal pronoun, they, the equivalent of the passive voice, two were proposed. Verses 24 and 25. Then they prayed, Lord, you know the hearts of all. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to assume the task of this service and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. A grammatical note, literally, to take the place of this service and apostleship is a Greek way of saying to assume this apostolic service. For the singular article with, with the conjunction and between two nouns suggests that the two nouns are related in some way. Here, Jesus Christ is called one who knows hearts. This adjective will occur again in Acts 15.8 about God giving his Holy Spirit to Gentiles for he knows the hearts of Gentiles as well. Now, why would the apostles believe that God should answer this prayer in a way that they could be sure of his choice? Well, some of you are already thinking of Proverbs 16.33, which reads, The lot is cast into the lap, yet its every decision is from the Lord. Then they cast lots for them, and the one chosen was Matthias, so he was counted with the eleven apostles. We'd like to note here that the term counted, Judas was counted amongst the apostles, in verse 17, is the verb katarithmeo, which means to count or to reckon, and you see the origin of the European term arithmetic. The term counted, that is, Matthias was counted amongst the apostles, is an entirely different verb in verse 26, which means to vote with pebbles. In other words, Matthias was voted a member of the apostles. Well, a couple of queries. Who actually chose Matthias to be counted with the 11 apostles? Well, it was the Lord Jesus Christ. It was not a vote of the assembly. Now, what importance do verses 15 through 26 have for Christians today? We would like to suggest that Luke is establishing in this chapter the absolute authority 
for all that the apostles will be doing in his account. First, the apostles' authority came from the Lord Jesus Christ, as we have seen in Luke chapters 9 and 10. The apostles sometimes interpreted the Tanakh literally with prediction fulfillment, and other times they repurposed its patterns and examples. Thirdly, New Testament scriptures, including the book of Acts, draw their authority from Jesus' apostles, whose authority came directly from Jesus. And therefore, we conclude that scripture has more authority than church leaders do. Thus, we find in the book of Acts seven terms describing the role of apostles. In verse 17, the Greek term kleros, meaning something like share or assignment, origin of the English term cleric. Again, in verse 17, this ministry is called a diakonia, meaning service or ministry, from whence our English term deacon. In verse 20, epalis is an abode or a dwelling, origin of the word epaulet, an indicator of rank. In verse 20 still, episcope, meaning oversight or an office with responsibilities, origin of our term episcopate or episcopal. In verse 22, the work of the apostle is that of a martus, a witness giving testimony, origin of our term martyr. And in verse 25, it is a topos, a place or a position, possible origin of the English term top. And in verse 25, lastly, it is apostole, that is, a delegate or an envoy, origin of our English term apostle. As you teach and preach this passage and lead Bible study discussions, the Holy Spirit will give to you further insight and application. As those whom you teach come to understand the authority of the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ and the scriptures that come from that authority, they will be mightily established and strengthened in their faith. Thus you will fulfill the commandment of Jesus to go make disciples.